Okay, so how stands the case? We've seen that Satan's arguments are all based on the self's good, which is an indirect way of accusing God of making us defective, because Satan's saying that if we're free to do wrong, then that has to be God's fault, and God is the one taking responsibility for that. Isaiah 50, 45, 7, I'm the one who created the evil one. Okay, corrected translation. Hebrew ra'ah is used as a substantive there, not as, just as an adjective. Um, ra, is better Americanized pronunciation of it. Um, so God's taking responsibility for creating freedom by by Christ taking on humanity and paying for sins. All right, and Satan's all ticked off about that. And again, there's this extra level question of whether Christ paid for angelic sins or not. And I submit that he did, and that Hebrews 2 supports that, because God has to be paid for all sin. Well, it's not only humans that sin. So how is he going to pay for all sin? And if he's human on the cross doing it, he's lower, so it's harder. It's not like he's an angel. That was the big point in... Hebrews 2, he's lower than angels. Okay, if he's lower than angels, then paying for angels is a bigger differential. And he's doing it on God's power, namely the Holy Spirit sustaining him, so it's doable. And he's got God's nature because he's God-man, so it's juridically correct. You see what I'm saying? It's harder if you're God-man to pay for sins of humans because you're not, you're, you're not use, it's like you're tying your hands behind your back. You're not using your own abilities to do it. It's being done to you. See why this God deed business is so much bigger than. It's the heart of the argument in the trial. Satan is making an argument based on how you made us of a certain nature. That nature fails. So you're the failure for making us the way you did. Okay, fine, so he'll make Christ lower than angels, which should be a bigger failure. And he's God at the same time, so the stretch. Can you imagine knowing you're God every time you pee? And you have to tie your hands behind your back, except sometimes. And you have to keep willing to hold the universe together. And yet you don't help yourself? You don't even use your deity to pay for sins? You don't use your power to help yourself or to pay for sins. I mean, does it get harder than that? That's like telling a billionaire he's not allowed to spend money. I mean, people want, it when they're rich, okay, the, the, the whole thought pattern of the rich versus the poor is very different. What rich people care about is accomplishing things. They, you know, they're not poor anymore. They're not, you know, trying to get the food on the table. So those needs are satisfied, but new needs take their place. And the need that everybody has is the, the desire to do good. This is why this is the heart of the trial. I mean, it's good to want to do good. That's Satan's big argument. Hi, God, you created us. You're good. You created us with a need to do good. You're inherently good. You do good. Okay, so what's wrong with our wanting to accomplish something in our own nature? And the answer is, it's not as good as God's good. So, okay, you want to accomplish something. That's what rich people really want to do. Okay, when you get rich, your, your whole focus changes. And you suddenly want to do good with the money you got. You know, you, you know the, the, the niceness of having goodies pales after about two weeks. If you were to inherit a billion dollars tomorrow or a million dollars tomorrow, you'd spend the first two weeks buying cars or TV sets or whatever. And after about two weeks, it would bore you to tears. And you'd want to do something more meaningful with the money. The inherent desire of man is to do good and get good. That's the sin nature talking. And to a certain extent, it's logical. There's a lot of broken stuff in this world. It's, it's an altruistic motive that's native to man. You want to do something for somebody else. You get more meaning out of it if you're helping somebody else. It's more satisfying than to do something just for yourself. 
You can only buy so many trinkets before you get bored. Okay? And, you know, extrapolate that to God. He's, we're, he's not benefiting from, from our existence. He likes doing for us. He likes that. So you can see where we get, uh, you know, that the sin nature is a sort of corruption of a God nature. God likes doing for other people. Or he wouldn't have made us in the first place. He likes it. Okay, we like doing for other people. That shows that we reflect him. Okay, but we got sin nature, so we're incompetent at what we do for people. And we got limits. And we got this sense of, well, I need to be rewarded for whatever I do for you. God doesn't have any of those, those corruptions. We do. You see the difference? So this whole trial about God's doing it to you or you doing it to you is a mixture of the understandable innate desire to be good and do good but you can't do it good enough you can't do it at God's level and God making it happen in you at his level the satisfying your need to be good and do good enough the only way it's going to be enough is if God does it to you Satan though because he sinned is all big on what he can do of his own and he doesn't want God doing it to him he wants to like merit something from God and we being sinners like him have that same attitude. Oh, I deserve better than this. Oh, I deserve this thing or that thing. Or I worked so hard after all I've done for you. People who talk like that hate you. Okay? Hatred talks about deserving. Hatred talks about merit. Hatred talks about what I do and you should pay me for. If you hated what you did, then you want to get paid for it. It's real simple. The hatred index is based on a claim for payment. If you hated what you had to do, if you hated what you got in return, you make a claim for payment. On the other hand, if you loved what you did, you don't want to be compensated because you got your compensation by being able to do it. Do you ask somebody to pay you for enjoying a good meal, your favorite meal? Let's say your favorite food on earth was peanut butter. And so you just got to eat a whole, you know, double tablespoon of peanut butter. Should God compensate you for that? Should God compensate you for enjoying yourself? No. If anything, if you have a if you're a sane mind, you're grateful for having the peanut butter. And that's why you pay for it. You are willing to pay money to get that peanut butter because you love that peanut butter. You're willing to pay to get something you love. And if it's something you hate, you want to be paid. Got that? See the difference? It's real important. If you want to know what you love and hate, or if you want to know if somebody loves or hates you, just pay close attention to the payment claims. If someone does something for you and you offer to pay them, they say, nah. That means they enjoyed doing what they did for you. If on the other hand, you don't say much of anything or somebody says, well, you owe me for this. Then you know they hated what they did for you. And they aren't too fond of you either. If you love God, if you did something that, you know, was right, like study Bible, you don't account that study as being good. You don't account it as something God should, like, reward you for doing that. It's like peanut butter. Oh, I get to eat peanut butter. I pay for that. Yeah, I went out and to the store and, uh, and personally, because I have peanut butter is my big thing. I went and bought, like, I don't know, 10 pounds of peanut butter. So I could never run short. 
if I got too busy. I was really happy to pay for it. I didn't go to God and say, well, God, I just paid 10 bucks for pay for peanut butter. Now you owe me because I did a good deed to buy the, pay the peanut butter. Yeah, if I hated peanut butter, I'd do that. See what, I'm, see what it is? If you put a dollar in the collection plate and you're expecting God to reward you, then you hate God. And you hated putting that dollar in the collection plate. If instead you felt grateful and you felt like, you know, like you wish it could be more, it wasn't enough, then you loved putting that dollar in the collection plate. Or maybe it was stupid to put it in the collection plate. That's kind of beside the point. The love index and the hate index is measured by whether you think you ought to get paid for what you just did. If you think you ought to get paid for what you just did, you're telling the world and yourself, if you would pay attention, that you hated what you just did. If you would have done it for free and actually you even think that you ought to pay somebody for being able to do what you just did, then you love what you just did. If you do something for somebody and, and you're, you're thrilled to be able to do it, if anything you feel you want to pay that person for the, the privilege of doing what you did for them, then you love them and you love what you did. God doesn't ask us to reward him. Where does it say anywhere in the Bible that God says, you owe me? God never says that. God also never says that, that you deserve to go to hell. You don't deserve to go to heaven and you don't deserve to go to hell. He never says that. either one. God doesn't talk about deserving. He talks about what you do and what we do. He talks about, hi, if you're a bad, you know, you bad, got bad behavior, I got to punish you. Yeah, parents who love their kids have to do that. No parent likes to punish their kids. They do it because the kid needs it in order to learn. Of course, a bad parent does it because he's trying to get even with his kid because he doesn't love his kid. You see the difference? God deeds are what God does to you. Good deeds are what you do yourself. And if you're doing good deeds, you expect payment from whoever you think you did it for. And usually you're expecting some kind of reward from God, which means you hate what you did and you hate God too. Or you hate whoever you did it for. I worked for eight hours on copying. I had to copy for eight hours. I want to get paid for that. Yeah, because you hated it so much. Okay, so let's go back to the morality argument since that's Satan's cornerstone. Satan saying, well, see, I can do all this good. Look at all this good I'm accomplishing in the world. I'm enabling all these people who you know, believe like I do, to do all these good deeds, look at all the good we're doing in the world. You owe me, God. Okay. And that's a moral argument. But how moral is it if the argument that he's making is to a God he hates? God made him. That's his big point. You made me. Everything I do, if it's right or wrong, it's because you made me this way. That's a hatred argument, don't he? Okay, well, if God made him that way, then all the good that he did, God enabled. Because God made him that way. And of course, Satan is, is nodding his head saying, yes, 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 yes. Because then he gets to use the flip side. Any bad he does, God also enabled. Okay. God enabled you to choose between one or the other, too. Why didn't you choose the nice stuff? Why did you choose the bad stuff? God enabled you to choose one or the other, just like God has that choice. So why didn't you make the choice that God would make? You were enabled to make the same choice. 
And, number one, God made you. There's no dispute about that in the trial. Okay, if God made you, do you have absolutely no gratitude for the fact that you are breathing solely courtesy of the Lord Jesus Christ? Is there no gratitude there? Isn't that moral to be grateful to the one who gives you and sustains your life and gives you those abilities to choose and gives you those abilities to do good? Where's the gratitude? You want to talk about morality. Where's the gratitude? Where's the respect? I mean, you know, this is kind of fundamental in the human race. We all should understand this. Our parents went through, even if they're bad parents, they went through X amount of trouble. They didn't, you know, with us. When I was born, well, I can't talk about me because I was adopted, but other people, for the most part, when they're born, their parents don't pick them up and drop them on a doorstep. Their parents pick them up and try to go through the expense and hassle of taking care of their kids. They do a bad job of it, they do a good job of it. Nobody's perfect. You know, it's, very, it's, it's an extreme hassle to raise kids. I can understand why I was left at somebody's doorstep. Because, you know, it was a hassle and in a way I'm grateful that it happened that way. Because the parents I had, I'm really happy that they are the parents that I have. I would have never found them if I wasn't left on somebody's doorstep. They would have never found me, let's put it that way. And God was the one who designed all that. You see the point? It's a hassle to raise kids. So the kids should be grateful to the parents for whatever effort they expended to do that. Because the parents could have just abandoned them. I mean, that, that's a common practice in China. In fact, it's actually a law. It has been for quite a long time. And not just China, but Asia and Europe and everywhere else in the world. It used to be that if a female baby was born, and even sometimes if a male, and in the Greek practice of the same thing, if, if the child was born with defects, you threw it off a cliff. So that a lot of the Greek plays, like for example, Ion by Euripides, where you abandon the child, you, it's called exposing. And one of the common words, uh, technical words for it in Greek lit, is to expose the child. You basically wrap it up, and that's a uh, theme of uh, Ezekiel 16. <clears throat> you wrap it up, or you don't wrap it up, and you leave it in the woods or somewhere to be eaten. Okay? Why didn't our parents do that to us? So we should be grateful to our parents for whatever effort they expended. And you have to take it for granted that they're going to screw up some of what they did because they're human too. It's a big hassle. They have to, you know, take care of their own lives and ours. And we can't do anything. We're helpless. They have to do it to us. You get the parallel? So how come Satan's not grateful to God for God making him? Satan has the freedom to screw it up or not. And God's sustaining his freedom to do it badly or not. Enabling all the abilities that he's got, because God could say at any time, Boop, Satan, you're gone. But God doesn't do that. Where's the gratitude? So how moral is it to make an argument to God that he should reward you based on what you can do? Isn't that the very definition of evil? Here God gives you life. He gives you the ability to do good or bad. To have the consequences of your own decisions. And you're going to tell him he owes you something? For what you do? It doesn't get more immoral than that. Peace out.